Bridgestone's installation ceremony in Hartford, Connecticut, the first installation in our state's capital. Today, we join a network of dozens of other memorial stones throughout the state and unveil two separate stones after this memorial ceremony. My name is Caitlin Oberndorfer. I'm a craft bird of Hartford Academy of the Arts American History teacher just down the road at the Colt Gateway. It's tucked behind the Thomas Hooker Brewery, which you wouldn't think so for a school, which is wrong with me. Uh, we are here today with 35, 33 total, get some lost, of my 11th grade students across my American history class, three separate sections, and my coworkers who have stepped up to chaperone today's field trip, who belong to the history department primarily and our 11th grade AI and support staff. Throughout the school year, my students and I have participated in the Witness Stones Project with the intention of researching, memorializing, and humanizing the lives of two people who were enslaved in our capital city at the close of the 17th century and through the beginning of the 18th century, well before even the creation of the nation and the inception of the American Revolution, a time when Connecticut held the most people in bondage out of the 13 colonies. The story begins even a century before the creation and use of this building we're hearing today, the old state house, and over 150 years before the creation of the cult factory property, uh, property, the cult factory complex, our school calls home. Their bones, of the two people we've researched over the past year, likely reside at the Hartford Ancient Burying Ground, only a mile away from our school and from this building, within walking distance of this very spot. Yet we've learned that their enslavers, the family tagged as one of the founding families of the Connecticut colony. And while uh, uh, they're not, and other white uh, residents of one of the three principal towns in the Connecticut Colony, uh, their stories are shrouded in mystery, and they receive far less coverage in the source record and in Connecticut memory, both public and academic memory, when it comes to the people who have researched this year. We have fought against these historical silences indicative of their stories, analyzing scarce primary and secondary sources through the lens and themes of the Witness Stones Project to bring their lives and their history humanity to you all today. Today we come together to remember their stories not just as examples of Connecticut slavery, but we come together to remember them as individual people. People even through the institution of slavery could have possessed their own hopes and dreams and other indicators of a basic sense of humanity that the Connecticut colony neglected to recognize through their enslavement. Today we remember a family. Today we remember Hannah Deuce and her son, Abda Deuce Jennings. Although we come together to celebrate their acts of agency and resistance, particularly the way Abda fled his enslaver and secured his freedom in the Connecticut Colony court system, we also mourn the collective devastation slavery still has on a landscape of black civil rights today in Connecticut and throughout the nation. We still recognize that today serves as a reminder of northern states like, Connecticut's, um, like Connecticut, their historical inability recognize their complicity in the institution of slavery today is to try to rectify that that sad inequality in our, in our memory in the way we look at history here in the north we recognize that these such programs serve as a reminder of our duty to challenge the narrative that slavery was somehow lesser in connecticut through those lines of thinking we permanently bury the memory of individuals like hannah and abda who deserve to have their stories shared and their names remembered my students and our keynote speaker, Pat Wilson Billings, will share with you all not only the story of Hannah and Abda, but food for thought on the value of individual stories of slavery. We hope for the city of Hartford, specifically that today stands as a reminder that there is much more work to be done in remembering its enslaved people. Their bones still rest unmarked and hidden in the shadow of the state's capital building. As a district that exists as an outgrowth of the Shep versus O'Neill case that sought to rectify racially based education and quality in Connecticut, we are humbled as a school community to take part in such a momentous day. As such, we are filled with gratitude and would like to extend our deepest gratitude to members of our community who made today's event possible and extended its reach through its live stream. The Old State House, first and foremost, has been so generous in lending us this space this opportunity to live stream. Particularly, I would like to thank um, Sally Whipple, Jacob Warcraft, Mariana Garcia, and Ali Cap for their assistance not only in today, but additional aspects of this Witness Stones program. And of course, those of you here today from the Old State House staff, what haven't met person before. The Graustein Foundation, 
The head of the Grasskin Foundation, David Adams, was kind enough to allow us a director's uh, grant to make today possible, specifically the installation of two separate witness stones. Even though he cannot be here today, we remember his gratitude, his kindness, and his acknowledgement of the importance of this history. Central Connecticut State University, specifically not just for partnering me and our school with the Witness Stones Project, that's specifically uh, Dr. Leah Glazer I'm shouting out, but also Dr. Kathy Hermes, who did preliminary research on the ancient burying ground and 300 plus people of color who resided there unrecognized. It's because of that preliminary research that all of us here today from my school were able to delve into the stories of Hannah and Abda. I want to thank Center Church, and that includes not only Reverend Liza, who has a beautiful last name that I'm about to butcher, or Lim Hope, or Lim Hope. I practice this. I practice this this morning, and it's gorgeous, and I am not living up to that. Thank you very much. I think not anyone here today from the Center Church, or anyone here today we're going to see later on from the Center Church. Again, we extend our kindness for them allowing us the space to install two separate witness stones when we otherwise would not have been capable of doing that today. So we recognize their time, and again, their acknowledgement of our mission and vision. We would thank our keynote speaker today, Pat Wilson Phineas of the Witness Stones Board, ninth generation Senate of Connecticut enslaved persons, accomplished educator and activist whose background goes on far longer that I can give it justice and I'll let her do that later. Uh, but again, we were going to figure out that she's a wealth of knowledge, charisma, enthusiasm, and we're thankful for her presence here today. Dennis Culleton of the Witness Stones Project for making this experience a reality for all that you've done in creating the Witness Stones Project and extending it to our school and dealing with yours truly for extended periods of time. My students will tell you that's certainly no easy feat. I urge other educators to strongly consider partnering with the Witness Stones Project as we have. It is a humbling experience and an immeasurably valuable one to share with my students. And I'm deeply appreciative of what kind of mark that's made on our school year and an otherwise very difficult one when during COVID we haven't had the opportunity to have outreach efforts of its magnitude. Last but not least, I want to thank my 11th grade students, and this one's going to be sappy, and I'll turn it over to our keynote speaker if you guys don't listen. I want to thank those 11th grade students who are present with me today and those who are still tucked away at our school. In completing this project, we've taken a step towards rectifying a gap in more than public memory of the existence and impact of slavery, specifically in the North, but of course across the United States. You have illuminated the stories of two individuals who they have received fleeting mentions in the source record and have not received the intensive uh, introspection into their biographies other colonial members of Hartford have received until, of course, Kathy Hermes, Dr. Kathy or Kermit Hermes efforts and our own research that built on that foundation. We are the first installation ceremony in Hartford. Collective action and work does matter. It's tangible and reminds us this history we remember and celebrate is not only a conscious decision, but this celebration makes an impact on the reflection of our society. I hope this is the first of many instances you have to pause and reflect on the stories we find throughout our communities of work and life and wonder what they say about our societal values and whether or not these values can be expanded on to meet the demands of a history that needs to be told. I urge you to remember that our own school comes from a reevaluation of inequality expressed in our capital city. It is inequality that brings us here today in more ways than one. As your teacher, I've watched you grow throughout a very difficult school year as students, as public historians in training, and as human beings. I'd like to take the time for you, or a time to thank you for working, rather, with me this year and taking risks that extend beyond both of our comfort zones. I'd like to publicly say, immortalized on this live stream, that I'm eternally thankful I got the chance to be your American history teacher. I'm not going to choke up on a live stream. I hope that as you take the mantle of being the senior class of our building and keep the lessons of today in mind, specifically when it comes to the power of your voice and the weight of your actions and decisions. I expect greatness from you all. You finish your time here at God, move beyond our school into new communities. I love you all dearly and remind you that you here at God not only belong to our academy family, but additionally that your grade depends on saying hi to me next year to seniors. Without further ado, though, moving on, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Pat Wilson Phineas, to the mic. For my students especially, I don't think she's a great character, but I'm going to need you to listen up. She is a wonderful woman. She is kind beyond measure, and we are thankful to have her here today. Everybody give it up for our keynote speaker.
thank you very much, Ms. Goldmeyer. She's a wonderful teacher. I only had a few minutes to talk to her on the telephone, but you are so lucky to have someone with that level of enthusiasm and courage and interest in dynamism. So, good morning. I'm happy to be here um, to appreciate the life of Hannah and Abda, one largely of injustice, but ultimate survival. More especially, though, I'm here to celebrate you. The hard work that your teachers did, the knowledge that you have uncovered, and the compassion and spirit of inquiry with which I suspect you digested this hard history. Let me tell you a little about my experience with finding my own history just a bit before there was an official Witness Stones program. In 2018, I was running to be the state representative of my district, District 53, ultimately successful and served a term. But I was not expecting a call from a middle school teacher, history teacher from Guilford. The Witness Stones project with Dennis was then in its embassy, not yet fully incorporated. And Dennis Cullinan had pursued a hobby for some years, working on his own with a friend, Dennis Snydren, and leading his students to uncover the stories behind people who had been left out of the history of their town. He was excited to be talking to me. At that time, I knew nothing about his efforts, but my voice was the living end to years of his dusty research. Dennis had been researching the lineage of two teenagers who were enslaved in 1727 by a childless Scottish merchant and his wife who lived in a house on the Guilford Town Green. Their name was Naughty, oddly enough, N-A-U-G-H-T-Y-E, and they imported the teens from Africa through the Caribbean to Boston. The teens became a couple, and over the next 25 years, although they had eight children, um, six of whom lived, they only had one grandchild named Caesar. The Naughties died, leaving a small plot of land and furnishings to their enslaved and indentured family. Dennis traced young Caesar through his children and his children's children's children until he came upon the obituary of a 21st century descendant of some note, a Tuskegee Airman, Lieutenant Colonel Bertram Wilson, who died in 2002. The first obituary Dennis found mentioned no family, another dead end. But nearly a year later, Dennis came upon a locally published obituary penned some 16 years before he found it. And luckily, this second obituary mentioned that the airman's two daughters, one of whom was then the state commissioner of social services. It was easy from there, with a few telephone calls, he found under all that documentation, a living descendant, me. In an hour of excited exchanges, Dennis gave me five generations of family that I had no previous connection to. Now please understand, even before that day, I was proud to be who I am. I just didn't know exactly the connection I had to an ancestral past was my skin color. And in an all white environment like Ashford was in the 50s, that really stood out. Connection to family beyond my great grandfather to distant family past was a single faded photo of a young woman dressed in Civil War garb. She looked neat and proper and well dressed and secure, almost too much so, I thought, considering she could not have been long out of slavery. I wondered who she was. My family called her Aunt Delia or Miss Dealey, ultimately. No idea of her real name or relationship. But oddly, she looked just like my sister's daughters. We used to tease them about it. A curiosity. I didn't think we needed that woman from some nebulous past. My pride and security came from my father. His security and drive came from the success of his uncles and the outstanding examples of his own father and grandfather had set. These men excelled in science, music, and education. We're talking about the early 1900s, Yet all these men had been to college, traveled the world, owned homes, were secure, and known to be respected in their world and active in their communities. What I knew of these ancestors made me proud. But beyond my great-grandfather, I knew nothing. There were only lingering questions. When I looked at that old picture, I assumed like what I'd been taught in school was true, and that real life for black people in this country began with the Emancipation Proclamation. I always wondered how Miss Dealey went through slavery security from ignorance and servitude to independence and maybe college in just a few years. 
How have my relatives managed to come so far in such a short time? I wondered, but no matter they did, and I didn't think I needed to know the past. Like so many black children, I didn't know my past beyond slavery. So bearing the unspoken shame of having been chattel, I was taught to focus on the future, to use the past, but only as a vehicle for movement toward the future. Instead of relying on a past that I couldn't capture with pride, I was reared to believe in my own current ability. I was taught to rely on myself and to avoid disappointment by expecting no assistance and maximizing my every strength and option. I was raised with the principles embodied in the Tuskegee Airmen's Code. Aim high, use your brain, be ready to go, never quit, expect to win, and rise above. I was also raised with the story of the tortoise and the hare. So until the day I met Dennis Culloden, these old questions lingered. I just didn't think that they mattered. How do you miss something that you never had? I could not have understood just how important the answers to those questions were. The fact is, I hadn't seen myself in anything I learned in school that happened before the Civil War. There was only slavery as a historical context. I imagine that 1863 was somehow a defining date. I hated studying American history because the only place I came up in it was the Civil War, where my ancestors were depicted as slaving in the cotton field or fiddling and dancing in the sun. When we studied slavery to my classmates, I was the visual representation of a slave. Not much to feel good about. When Dennis's work in my real history came to light, I learned for the first time about who my forebearers were and what they did, and it had a profound effect on me. That day, I think I found a missing piece of my soul. I learned that yes, my ancestors had been enslaved here in Connecticut, but during those years of enslavement, family members had become a slave king and a fat totem, fought as a freedman in the Revolutionary War, been fiddlers and spinners, been memorialized in biographies and memoirs. Some became literate, owned and passed property onto their families. Some became ministers, one of whom mounted a movement to find homes in Africa for former slaves. And all of this, or most of it at least, well before the Civil War began. And I learned that that old picture of Miss Dealey was actually my second great grandmother, Ardelia Burks Wilson, and that she, while somewhat older, um, was in the same graduating class at Hampton with Martin Luther King's mother. I was amazed. You might wonder what the significance of finding my family's history was at my age. If you don't know your full history, you cannot know your full value. And this is as true for a nation as it is for an individual. Do you ever hear Rika Brzezinski on the morning news or talk about the Forbes? list of know your values and its importance to women in the forever fight for opportunity and equal pay for white men. Knowing my history gave me a new and greater measure of my value. The gift of my history changed me. Knowing my history expanded my horizons. It increased my commitment to this country. It anchored me. Of course, some facts made me mad and some of it made me sad. But ultimately, I was reoriented and invigorated by this knowledge. The new knowledge changed the way I looked at myself and what I saw as my purpose. It made me appreciate my place in the history of this country. I am the ninth of 11 generations of an American family. Knowing this gives me a sense of belonging, ownership, and entitlement, not just to a family legacy, but to this nation. This knowledge made me love America more because I realized how very deeply I was already invested. How dare someone suggest that this land is not mine? My experience in school hadn't given me that investment. You see, everything I've been taught in school led me to feel that America was my country essentially by default, that I always felt somehow that I was a lesser American. Why else would I see myself in nothing talk to me about this country? Why else would kid tease me that I should go back to where I came from. With this knowledge, I know that America is mine because 300 years of my ancestors' sweat and tears earned her for me. My people didn't inherit America. 
or get their rights as squatters or through land grants freely given to others. They earn their place in our history and in this land with their blood. And they shaped and fought for America's existence and freedom at a time when their own was denied. The patriotism that my father, a Tuskegee Airman, demonstrated by fighting in three wars, not just World War II, but also Korea and Vietnam. It's not a new theme. Black men have had to fight in order to be allowed to fight and to die in the name of this country, just to be treated as though we don't belong. Having to fight in order to fight for this country is not a new theme for black people. Why is this? Think on that issue for a moment. Factual historical information made me grateful that I was born in a time when I could control my own destiny and that I am strong enough to cherish the lessons of a time when I could not. I'm grateful that I live in a country with the honor and endurance to want to learn and grow. Learning my history made me proud of all that my forefathers bore and built. It made me curious about what else I do not know, and it made me want to uncover, discover, and share. It made me want to grow what I know and learn more about where others are coming from. What if I had never gotten this exposure? And after all you've learned, what if you had been too timid to explore? What understandings might you have missed? A number of questions have come up from students about things like how this new knowledge changed the way I looked at what I used to know, and I'll share just a bit about that. This new experience very much changed my thoughts and opinions about slavery in Connecticut, because I hadn't even known that there were slaves in the North, let alone thousands across all 13 colonies. I had been taught that Lincoln freed the slaves, the fact is, Connecticut's enslaved were freed by operation of law more than 25 years before the Civil War. I never knew that black men fought in the Revolutionary War, certainly not my fifth great-grandfather. I ask you, when did you learn in school that as many as 5,000 black men, free and enslaved, fought as patriots in the Revolutionary War? Was it just now? I always assumed that you had to be white to be a patriot. The experience of finding this information out so late in my life made me question why this knowledge was denied to me in the first place. I have always felt what I considered was an excellent education. Ashford Elementary School, Yale Smith, like three degrees from UConn, and yet they never taught me what I most needed to know. What might have been the impact of such knowledge on me as a child? My self-esteem? my wanting to learn about American history? What might the impact of such knowledge have had on my classmates? Would I have felt their respect rather than their subconscious disdain for my heritage? I've done extensive research into other parts of my family since then, and it's been a wonderful awakening to learn about both sides of my family in this way, and to then do some DNA testing and get a few surprises. Like I always thought that I had Native American blood, and I ends up I have 1% Native American blood and an equal 1% from Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Um, I ended up having 24% Nigerian, 16% Cameroon, 15% Ivory Coast blood, and 13% from Ireland. Surprise. Um, you wonder the kinds of things that I got from learning about these enslaved people was, and finding right through to my grandchildren, watching how the history of black people in this country have um, developed through all of the eras of pre-enslavement, displacement, enslavement, manumission and emancipation, the hopes dashed by reconstruction, the era of the KKK and Jim Crow, Harlem Renaissance, the war years, then the civil rights era from Malcolm X, from Martin Luther King to Malcolm X, the Black Lives, I sometimes cynically say, still don't matter era, and now my grandchildren's fight, which is your fight, to retain our, and maintain our democracy and to reach with our whole population of Americans that more perfect union that we seek. Um, students wanted to know what they needed to learn, unlearn, and relearn. 
And I think that may be worth sharing. In terms of learning, we need to learn the importance of context and perspective. It's helpful to understand how very old and embedded slavery was in the Western Hemisphere. Its appearance in America was influenced by the early expiration of the Spanish, Dutch, French, and English. We need to think about the history of black people in the new world as not having begun in slavery, but having begun in freedom. Because in 1494, Columbus brought free black men with him to Hispaniola, but we never hear about that. We need to recognize that ongoing impact of slavery and subsequent state-sponsored barriers to equal protection and opportunity continue to this day. Think about disparities. Look at the overwhelming evidence of documented gaps in outcomes between blacks and whites. There are extensive gaps in wealth, health, education, and opportunity. There's a disparity in home ownership, insurance, and banking practices. There are disparities in maternal and child health, and overemphasis in criminal justice i.e. mass incarceration, and the regular denial of civil justice, voter suppression, bird watching while black. We have to unlearn the fact that in the world, we don't capture those words, all men are created equal. We don't capture the meaning of them. And we have to unlearn the way we look at society, because we tend to look at it through the the vision of white supremacy. We tend to, we, we think about <laughs> me and this thing. We think about manifest destiny, and we didn't realize that that wasn't directed to everybody. It was only directed to white young men. They wanted to go west. Everybody else was denied. We have a tendency toward the distortion of sees America and American history as the origin story of its landowning founders instead of others, and we tend to ignore the cultural aspects that black history is brought. We think of black history as well, it was free labor, and isn't that a shame? We don't think of the things that we never hear about. Did you realize, for example, that patents by black people are held for dry cleaning, refrigerated train cars, ironing board, folding beds, street sweepers, traffic lights, HVAC systems, the heat and cold that we feel in our house, home security systems, all of these were invented by black people and patented by black people. And how many of these things do we hear about? We have to relearn the importance of civic engagement because that is the key to all of our survival. And civic exclusion, the problems it creates, the way it will destroy our society is equally important to know. We need to relearn that history is being made every day and that you are making it. You have the power and the duty and the right to correct wrongs, wrongs that are made, and to make things better for your children and grandchildren. And we need to relearn that simple aspiration that we pledge at every public gathering, but whose basic aspirations is being forgotten. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in light of the time, I, I would go along. I'm an old teacher. I could talk for hours. I won't. <laughs> I would rather and here, find out if you have any specific questions that you'd like me to address or move on to the program. Anything? Think anything else to say? No? Oh, please. I can't hear you, I'm just. Uh, 68. <laughs> so, or it's almost 69. So, yeah, it was about three years ago. And for all of this time, not having had that um, is a real detriment. I mean, I did fine, and I, you know, would say, well, you look like you did all right to me. It's inside that's missing. It's the constant need, running, trying to catch up, never feeling quite good enough, and always being maybe better but not knowing. That's where you get it inside. Please. Well, absolutely. I didn't find it. Dennis Culloden found it. He, this wonderful man that will come up here at some point, handed me all this information, so I can't take credit for the research. But yes, I have the original um, documents where they came. I can't get back to Africa, but I can get from the Caribbean. 
So I had the slave ships where both Montrose and Phyllis, who were my forebears, came um, and went to Boston. I've got the paperwork of the deed, various deeds and property that were left in them and property that they left to their family. I've got all the manumission documents. And in fact, I'm, I'm struggling or hoping to, to use this information to create a curriculum that ties in much the way other witness notes project do, ties the backstory to my family because it was kind of the origin story for the witness notes program in the sense that the original research that Dennis did was just happened to be on my family. And so when he found a living descendant, he was especially excited because usually, you know, you don't. But think about this. Everybody comes from somewhere. Every person in here has a history, has ancestors, made a contribution to this country. And we all need to claim it, recognize it, cherish it, and incorporate it into our lives. That's, that's what America is. And I'm so glad that you all had an opportunity, um, you know, had an opportunity to do this. So let me just close with a couple of thoughts about um, Al, if I can find my questions here. Um, I guess this microphone. I guess I just wanted to say that your legacy, in some ways, of this class is leaving those stones in the ground because every time you lay a stone, it makes a place for remembrance. So I thank you and your teachers for your work, your questions, your diligence, your compassion, the generosity of your spirit, and I thank you for your willingness to grow. Because Hannah and Abba, as tragic as their life was, would be proud to know that so many years later, their unrecognized lives could mean something. Hannah would be glad that the injustices done to her are finally recognized. And your recognition gives them dignity that they didn't have or that they had in their souls but were never given in life. You recognize their accomplishments, and by lending them your voice, you gave them one. So as one single representative of a million unknown descendants, I want you to know that your work has in important ways not just affected their past lives, but I think that you have made us all stronger because of your work and because of your growth. And um, I suspect that their stories have changed you in important ways. I hope so. And I thank you for your attention. fix the tech issue that's been plaguing me this entire time. I am so glad that you guys gave Pat Wilson Phineas a wonderful round of applause. As I said, I, I couldn't do her justice as far as the weight that she gets our program to get the idea of the humanity, the connection to her own identity. That's something that we didn't have the luxury of having even through this project. We're so grateful that we have a direct descendant to show us again the value of that work beyond even the value of the Whitney Stones project gives to us you know, in the education program proper. So again, I want to give a secondary round of applause to Pat Wilson Phineas. <laughs> it's our juniors at the end of the year. I'm tired too. I want to sit down. Trust me, they love this. All right, now comes our presentation, and I want to turn it over to my students. Uh, they have, again, as Pat Wilson Finney has said, grown in immeasurable ways, not only through their project, but through their experiences this year, cross-curricularly, that ties to the Witness Stone's mission and vision. I would like at this time to welcome to the mic my uh, Keystone student speaker, if you will, Julia Alea, who has taught me a thing or two this year. Everybody give a round of applause. <laughs> Hi, my name is Julia Ayala and I'm a junior at Garam. I went to Cromwell, a predominantly white district from second to eighth grade. The switch from a Cromwell school to a prep school was huge. At first, I was uncomfortable and uneasy, but God started to feel like a real community. As a kid, learning about slavery was always such an uncomfortable thing, considering I was one of the only children of color in the room. It was awkward. But in Ms. O's American history class, it was different. 
I was comfortable and engaged, and so was everyone else in the room. This year, we talked about slavery in Hartford, Connecticut, a topic often neglected or forgotten about because, after all, Connecticut was a part of the Union and against slavery. Right? No. Thousands of daughters, mothers, fathers, sons, aunts, and uncles were enslaved right here in Hartford, Connecticut. Ms. O made a point to teach us what we can do to humanize these people who at one, part, who at one point weren't even seen as human. A family highlight, highlighted was Hannah Lucy and a, a mother who was raped by two white men and her son, Abed Deuce Guineas, the result of his mother's assault. Instead of bringing her rapist to justice, all the two men had to do was pay a fine for foreign location while Hannah was publicly whipped. All this happened right here in Mark. In class, we learned about the family and their story to humanize them, give them back the power that was taken from them. At one point, we compared the family trees of Hannah and her enslavers. When it came to the white family, we could track years back. When it came to Hannah and Abba, we knew close to nothing. The family tree shows lack of respect and sense of humanity they didn't have for the family. All of this happened right here in Harvard. When we looked at Abba's probate records and compared it to his first and second enslavers' probate records, we saw the same kind of inequality. Even after Abra won his freedom instead of for his own humanity, he still never gained the kind of wealth or freedom as his enslavers. Right here in Hartford, you can still visit their graves and see their impressive carved headstones that were likely bought through wealth Hannah and Abra helped to create for their enslavers. We cannot do the same for Abra. For his mother, Hannah, for his wife, Lydia, for his son, Joseph, or for the most the almost 300 people of color buried in the ancient burying ground just a mile from our school. All of this happened right here in Hartford. What can we do for Hannah and Arthur that we cannot do for their enslavers is continue to learn about their ages of agency, their acts of agency and resistance. Today we came together to unveil a permanent memorial of their memory to their memory. Although their enslavers have their own permanent memorial, naming them as founders of Hartford, Hannah and Arthur deserve the same respect. We are here today to respect, to remember them in respect and in spirit of humanization. And yes, today all of this will happen. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to cry when these guys graduate. It's not going to be pretty. I would now, on a happier note, like to welcome to the mic my student, Caitlin. Please pronounce your last name again before I push it. I can still mess that up. How? <laughs> who I have lovingly dubbed Caitlin Jr., which is easier to say. That's my first name too. They will share with us a brief synopsis of the lives of Hannah and Abda. Please give a round of applause for our student speaker, Caitlin. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, Kate Kapisa Sheehan, and um, this is the essay I wrote for the Witness Stones Project. In Hartford's ancient burial ground, two unmarked graves speak to the legacy of Connecticut's slavery. These are the graves of Hannah Deuce and Abda Deuce Jones. Over the last month of my American history class, we have been learning about the story and legacy of Hannah, in addition to the legacy of slavery in Connecticut that we need to confront. We also need to humanize the enslaved, like Hannah Deuce. Hannah was a person, a person who was enslaved, assaulted, humiliated, dehumanized, and at the end of it all, didn't live to see her son a free man or meet her grandson who was born free. The history of her endurance and the courage of Abda is a story that needs to be told in order to accomplish the aim of recognizing slavery as a whole and restoring the humanity of individual lives. When people think of the enslaved, they often think of southern states, not Connecticut. This state has a long and untold history with slavery. As of 1776, Connecticut had the highest number of enslaved out of the 13 colonies, just over 5,000. In 1784, and 
an emancipation proclamation, an emancipation plan was put into action, though the state was slow to free enslaved peoples to protect white jobs. By the year 1800, the Connecticut population of enslaved peoples was 1931. Slavery in this state didn't end officially until 1848, long after its fellow southern states. Hennan Abish's story shows the undiscussed slavery in the North. Hannah Deuce was enslaved in Hartford, Connecticut, the state's capital city, in the late 17th century by James Richards and later his son Thomas. These two men were also considered central founders of the Hartford leg of the Connecticut colony. In 1673, during her enslavement by James Richards, two white men, John Jennings and William Hadwell, sexually assaulted her. She soon realized she was pregnant as a result of the assault, later giving birth to her son, Abda. Though it is unknown which man is, which man is the biological father, he was given the surname Jennings. Upon going before a judge, they did not think her assault was a crime, given that she was considered property. Instead of getting justice for her, the court decided to charge all three with sex before marriage, giving them a choice between a fine or being publicly whipped. Given that Hannah's rapists were well-off white men, they paid the fine. Hannah, on the other hand, was an enslaved young woman who could not afford it. She was ultimately publicly whipped and humiliated, published for the unthinkable act committed against her. Though the injustice followed her son, he tried to write that legacy. Sorry. Hannah's son, Abda, despite being half white, was born enslaved. In 1703, Abda sued for his freedom from Richards. Abda escaped from Richards two times to get to court, with little help from authorities. He used his parentage, his mother's rape, and the fact that he was a Christian as reasoning for why he should be a free man. Even his wife, Lydia, testified while pregnant with their son, Joseph. After long debates and Richards treating Abda like he was a possession to be owned, the court case finally ended. Finally, Abda Deuce Jennings was a free man. Hannah never got to see her son free or meet her grandson, Joseph, who was born free. Even though it wasn't much, upon his death in 1709, Abda owned a few possessions of his own, though not nearly as much as his enslaver did at the time of his death. His son had his own home and a few possessions at the, end of, at the time of his death, doing slightly better than his father and that respect. Though Joseph Jennings, or Joseph Richards, the son of Abda's enslaver did not even did even better than his father at the time of his death, only furthering the wealth gap between the two. The Deuce Jennings family is the, the very embodiment of agency and resistance. Hannah persevered, and even though not much is known about her historically, we know she had immense courage. Abda fought extremely hard to be a free man and to use his mother's assault to change their family legacy for the better. Joseph went on living, moving forward, despite living in the U.S. as a black man. Their stories deserve to be remembered, taught, un and understood. Hannah did not get the respect and justice she deserved when she was alive. The least we can do as a country a state, a town, and a school is to tell her story now. Thank you. All right. At this time, I would like to welcome to the mic my student, Holly Gottman, whose cheery curiosity has kept me smiling throughout this year. And they will share with us specific insights today on themes of the Witness Towns Project and how they specifically apply to the story of Hannah and Abda. Everyone give it up for Holly Gottman. Hello, I'm Holly Gottman. 
Martin and I'm in Ms. O's um, A5 class, and I'd like to talk to you today about the um, treatment of the enslaved, the economics of slavery, paternalism, dehumanization, and agency and resistance. America's stance on freedom has always been adulterated by its treatment of men, African Americans. While the founders of our country preached the importance of autonomy, they actively ignored the treatment of the people that the country enslaved and how that stood as a direct counter to the idea of liberty and justice for all. To justify enslaving, murdering, and torturing black people, white people had to dehumanize those enslaved to something less than human. It was the only way that the growing nation could rationalize this hypocrisy and how it applied to its foundational beliefs. Hiding for fear of their own evil, they excused their actions, saying that because white people were so clearly superior, they had the right to exercise power over African Americans, they had the right to aim their cruelty at those who couldn't fight like back. Not only did they think they had the indisputable right, but many in colonial America actively believed that the institution of slavery was an indisputable benefit to the enslaved population that supposedly could not participate in society without this system of control. They leveraged the sense of paternalism to capture the sense of undeserved superiority. In their minds, they were doing the best, righteous, deserved thing. They believed that entirely that they were doing nothing wrong, and they often felt no remorse. These were nothing but careless disguises for pure hatred. It is nothing short of evil to try to excuse the inhumane actions of the past and present. The nation leveraged this evil, the quote, original sin of slavery, to line its pockets with blood money. Yes, even in the North, beyond the reach of the stereotypical cotton plantations of the South, Look to colonial Villain, Connecticut and its prized original towns, Weathersfield, Windsor, and Hartford. All settled along the banks of the Connecticut River to channel the set to the sound, then to the Atlantic Ocean. Ships sent from the mouth of our state's prized waterway and made their way down to the West Indies before we even became a state. They sold Connecticut goods to the West Indies to buy sugar cane, harvested by another enslaved population. The sugar cane was processed in Connecticut, often turned into rum, often assisted by the colony's own enslaved population. As white merchants of Connecticut grew richer, the cycle began anew. And this is the only way the economics of slavery enticed, and this is the only one, only one way the economics of slavery enticed the colony to continue to tie itself to slavery, all while somehow managing to sleep at night. Even before the American Revolution, even before the founding of a nation built on inequality, slavery persisted in colonial America. But this unequal nation, this unequal colony, could never truly dampen the spirit of agency and resistance that characterizes slavery. Even though we don't often learn of the, of the individual stories of the enslaved, and instead about, learn about dehumanization, paternalism, the treatment of the enslaved, and the economics of slavery as the largest, larger, faceless themes, Stories of individual people and their individual expressions of agency exist. Like Hannah and Agatha, many black people put their life on the line to show that they were not simply going to accept their enslavement. Small acts of agency often empowered enslaved, segregated, and discriminated against African Americans to fight for their rights. In Abba's case, we have a documented act of agency so huge that it resulted in his emancipation. Even the Connecticut colony court system recognized that Abbott's story was a notable example of agency and resistance. While Abbott's story is special, it, and maybe even unusual, it still stands as one of the countless examples of agency and resistance in the history of Connecticut slavery. Even though these examples have even though many of these examples have been lost to history, maybe even purposely not recorded, that should not stop us in the present to continue to research the individual stories of slavery. In an America that is still very much so rooted in racial inequality, this work is not just in the engaging in classroom activity. It is vital work to fighting back against the shadow of slavery in present-day America, and yes, present-day Connecticut. <clears throat>
those poems just as an addendum if you're familiar uh, with the uh, manumission requiem fortune's bones by poet laurie and marilyn nelson some of our students pull from that literature so you might have something to look up later at this time i won't give it up for tell you Um, hi guys, I'm Ty, junior at um, Gop, and I'm going to be reading four poems that I wrote in the perspective of the enslaved. So, I am Hannah Deuce. I am Hannah Deuce. This is so funny. Sorry. <laughs> I wonder why I am being enslaved just because of the color, just because of the skin color that is pure beauty to me. My skin is brown and coca. It is rich and pure. It is my beauty. I hear commands against me constantly. I am dehumanized against my own will, having to always follow the directions of another who is in control of me and my body. I see the men who touch me sexually, not letting me get away. I am forced. I want to be free to live my own life. I am Hannah Deuce. I pretend to be okay to myself because there is not anything I can do to escape these men. I feel hurt that they treat me like an animal rather than a human being because of my race, which makes me who I am. I touch the work that they should be doing, that they have me doing for no cost, profit, or pay. I am their hard worker for their laziness. I worry that I'll never be able to gain justice or have my peace. I cry plenty of tears because I am so tired of not having my rights. I am Hannah Deuce. I understand that unfortunately, this is the world that I am living in today. I say all the time how this, is, that, how this isn't fair and how I, as well as others, will never deserve this. I dream to one day have, my, have a life of my own that's actually worth the living that I want to have. I try to stay happy and have as much joy as I can. I hope that they will soon learn how to accept that there is difference within all. No one is going to be of the same race or color. We shall all, we shall all be treated equally. I am Hannah Deuce. The next one is to my child. I didn't ask to have a child this early and unwillingly. I was great, taken advantage, taken advantage of, and used. The moment when I got touched sexually, no, the moment I got touched and sexually assaulted by him proved the involuntary patriotism done to me. It was for my good, my own good. This is what they wanted me to believe in my head. I had my baby young, my baby who I, who I gave the name Abda. Abda, I promise to be the best mother regardless of any circumstances we are in. I hope that one day you will be free to live your own life and to be happy. To my baby Abra, I love you and I will do all I can to be the greatest mother I can. Escaping free. I want to escape this slavery so I can be free. I am a white and black man. Agency and resistance is what I will show. I am enslaved now, but I will choose to make my own independent choices. I will not give up on gaining my freedom. I deserve to live my own life since I know that's what my mother has always wanted. I will battle within the court system to gain the justice and freedom that I deserve. Escaping to be free, part two. It is 1703. I fought to win my freedom against my enslaver Thomas Richards, and I finally won. He is one of the founders of Connecticut, and I won my battle against him. Now I can explore the world in my own eyes as a freed man. I can, I can finally say that after years of fighting for my freedom, I am free. It's going to be like a super pizza party when we get back to school. Odd, uh, not really don't get your hopes up. All right, for our last student speaker, I would like to invite to the mic uh, Faith Scott, accomplished poet, here to share with us our again final student speak before um, student speech before I turn it over to Dennis Culleton and Sally Whipple. Everyone, give a round of applause for Faith Scott, accomplished poet. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Faith Scott. I'm a junior attending. 
Okay, <laughs> so I am a junior attending Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, and I have a poem that I would like to share with everyone today. And it is going to be talking about the struggles that not only Anna and Anna went through in Connecticut, but also other slaves. The, to the title of the poem is We. In a world full of scheming lies, where victims are criminalized and victimizers are king-sized, where we run in the night from typewriters and crime fighters, where the rocks remind us of our truth, down to our very roots, for where slaves are meant to be used and abused. We get used to rape and guns because masters and their sons see it as fun, but we work under the sun until we come undone. Our sons are on trial because the world is in denial of the blood that runs through their veins, because they think that forever we belong in chains. Old masters pass away and treat us like cattle because that is the game. The game that decides our value and if we are worthwhile. The game that treats people like bones, crushing them to their unknowns. Even when proving their bloodline is mixed, they are treated like ticks from the dog, even when they did nothing wrong. Justice was never served to the mothers that are forced to share bed with others because their skin color is dirty to others. Justice was still not served even when they were grandmothers. Forced to rest in unmarked graves, but there are stories that remain waiting to be found for the voice to make a sound. Our past troops are slowly being uncovered. Even they are dust covered. They still have a voice even when they are bone covered. For we are people of color, never to be ashamed. And that is the last of our student speakers, but again, this is only just an example of the work our students have done this year and the thematic units that linked with the Witness Stones project and built on its mission and vision. I'm gonna give one last round of applause for my students, by my students. I'm eternally grateful to be your teacher. At this time, I would like to invite Dennis Culleton of the Witness Stones Project, founder, executive director, uh, my personal hero after this, I'm going to cry tears of joy. Dennis Culleton, give it up, everyone. say what an experience today. Um, when we started the Witness Stones project, it was in Guilford, Connecticut. If you've ever been to Guilford, it looks like a Norman Rockwell painting. There's an eight acre green, four churches around it, the town hall, a hardware store, a market. And it looks like what we used to close our eyes and think what Connecticut was like. I grew up not far from here, where near where 84 hits Massachusetts, and I used to close my eyes and think of colonial New England and think of you know, the Puritans, the people from England, maybe Scotland or Ireland, and maybe some indigenous people. But tomorrow we're gonna to be putting witness stones in about 10 miles from where I grew up for a man, Caesar, who worked in the same fields I worked in as a kid. Because I used to bale hay during the summer to help the farmers get hay in the, in the barns. And I was a football player, so it helped me get strong before, <laughs> before football season. So those are the same fields I worked in. and. I never imagined enslaved people worked there. When the project started in 2017, it was after a friend of mine, after hearing me talk about local slavery, I, I wrote a small 45-page booklet in Guilford, focusing a lot on Pavel's and Phineas's family, uh, Montrose and Phyllis, Flora and Caesar, and Candace and Aaron, and Pompey, and all of the family, this family that I kind of call our, you know, our Adam and Eve of, of the Witness Stones project, because through that family, we were able to find these five themes that you all looked at. Um, when we started the project in Guilford, after the first installation ceremony, people stepped back and felt the power of it and said, how do we bring this to other students? And that's what has been my life's work since 2017, is bringing it, continuing to bring it to Guilford, Connecticut, but also to other communities. And early on, people looked at me and said, you know, Mr. Colleton, you or you know, Dennis, you, you started this project in a community that pretty much all the kids are white, and pretty much all the kids are from the same socioeconomic class, and how are you gonna bring this to the city? And I said, I don't have to bring it to the city. I can bring it to a teacher. 
I can bring it to a teacher who knows the kids. I can bring it to a teacher who loves the kids, who understands the kids. The kids won't be afraid to say, I don't want to talk about that, or I don't want to do that, or can we talk more about that? I'll tell you today, this was the most PG version of a witness stones installation, because we're talking about rape. We were talking about awful, awful treatment, because sometimes it's easier to talk about the kind of bad treatment, but we talked about awful treatment today. We did it in such an adult way that I couldn't imagine leading this, uh, leading you in this project, but your teacher was able to do that. Kate Ellen and I, Mrs. O, or Ms. O, uh, started out, uh, she was an intern at Central Connecticut State University and eager to share her knowledge of what happened right down the street at the ancient burial ground where enslaved people were buried with unmarked graves with me and then understood that she could take her understanding and bring it to the classroom through the Witness Notes Project. And truthfully, this is the youngest teacher I've ever, ever worked with, and this is a teacher who, who I had to do the least for because she already did the research. She already knew the history. She already knew how to bring the history to you all. She just needed additional framework to do it with. So I'll just say that this is one of my, when we started the project and we thought about where we're gonna go with it, we have to be invited into communities. You can't go to a town or a school and say, you're gonna do witness on this project because it's too hard to do. It's too emotional to do. There's too much in the project that requires everybody to say, we're, we're on board. And so for a young teacher, just a few years into teaching, to say, we're gonna try this, we're gonna take on this challenge, we're gonna to work together with students who have completely or mostly different perspectives than other students and do something. And I'll just say, you know, <laughs> Pat and I have been going across the state all week. We're gonna be in Woodstock tomorrow, which is right where I used to bail hay. And as, as strong as I'll have feelings about telling the story of, of Caesar, hearing the stories, hearing you tell the stories of him and Abner today, I'll tell you, it, it, it makes me realize how, how we need to keep doing this and that you guys are going to be a leader in that. So thank you so much. My name is Sally Whipple. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House. And I wanted to say a few words to you about the place we're in today. Um, first, I wanted to say this project, Witness Stones, is so important to me because about 30 years ago, I was doing an exhibit in West Hartford. And I decided I would do my exhibit on African Americans who lived in West Hartford during the colonial period. And person after person told me there were no African Americans in West Hartford during the colonial period. But I started to do research and I started to work with the West Hartford African American Social and Cultural Organization, and we discovered many, many people. And we were able to share their names and tiny fragments of their lives with other people through that exhibit. And we were able to explain that yes, slavery did exist in Connecticut, and that there was very little information available about it at the time. In fact, I could only find two books around 1990 that really spoke to slavery in New England. One was written in the 1940s and one had just been published. So this is a very important project to me. The work that you're doing is critical. When I started um, the exhibit, working on the exhibit, I found a narrative written by a man named James Mars. James Mars wrote in his narrative that many people living on the stage of life did not know that slavery ever existed in Connecticut. And he wrote that in 1868, just 20 years after slavery was abolished in Connecticut. And James Mars, I am convinced, at one point stood in this room. We are in Connecticut's old state house, which is an early state capital for Connecticut. This is the land where Thomas Hooker founded the city of Hartford with other colonists. So this land and this building have long histories. And like all history, good things happened here and very bad things happened here. And after hearing um, about Hannah today, I have to be convinced that her punishment took place somewhere on this property because this was governmental property where they would have punished people. But, 
But again, James Mars also stood in this room, and I want to tell you why he stood here. Um, this room was a courtroom. This, this building, the state capitol, had all three branches of government in it. All kinds of good and bad laws were passed here. All kinds of good and bad rulings were made here. If you're familiar with the story of Putin's Crandall, her trial took place in this room. If you're familiar with the story of the Amistad, the Amistad captives led by Senge Kia were tried in this room. So this room has a very long and important history for our state. And all of you today with your research and your stories and your poetry and your curiosity have added to that history and become part of that history. I'm going to tell you just briefly what happened and why I think James Mars had to be in this room. In 1837, there was a woman named Nancy Jackson. Nancy Jackson had been enslaved in Georgia, and she was brought here by her enslavers, and she worked in Connecticut. And at one point, her enslaver wanted to bring her back to Georgia, where she would continue to be enslaved for the rest of her life. She did not want to go. And she approached James Mars, who was a Hartford community leader. And he worked with other people in Hartford, other black families and leaders in Hartford to secure her freedom. She came to this room for her court case and she actually had to come face to face with her enslaver when she was suing him for her, her, her um, freedom. And the story that James Mars told was that Nancy Jackson had morphine in her pocket. And if she lost the case, she was going to take it and kill herself right in this room. Nancy Jackson won her case. She won her freedom. And she did that through the court system. She didn't do it on her own. She did it with the support of the black community in Hartford, with people who walk the streets we walk today, who walk the streets that, that Hannah walked, and I think one of the best things that you're doing, that Witness Stones is doing all over Connecticut, is helping people imagine what these places were like over many, many years. There are many, many layers of history. There are many, many layers of stories, sad and heartbreaking and joyful and wonderful. There are stories of agency and resistance. There are stories of oppression. And they all mix up to make our history. And what you're doing is putting those people back on these streets, helping them tell their stories to other people as they um, explore Hartford and live in our, our, our city. And that is the most important work you can do. So I would put you um, on the pedestal where I keep James Mars and Senge Pia and Nancy Jackson and all of the others who have come before you. And I will tell you that now that we know Hannah's story, we will tell Hannah's story at the Old State House because it's an important one for people to know. She walked these streets, she walked this property, and people need to know that. So I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of the work that you've done to breathe life into the things that we see around us and to make a difference so that people can better understand our world and to make better decisions for the future. Thank you very much. All right, folks, this concludes our ceremony inside of the old state house. For those of you who are my students, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pack up my bag of tricks over here. I'm going to give you guys a count as well as my chaperones. We're just going to make sure we have all 33. And we're going to move over to Center Church. It's about a two minute walk, so before we leave this building, if you'd like to use the bathroom, uh, please say hi to one of our chaperones, all right? But as a parting notion before we get up, so everyone stay in your seat. I again want to thank the Old State House. I want to thank the Witness Stones Project and specifically Center Church, the Graustein Foundation, and CCSU for the help they've given us today, and countless others who again have donated their time for all of us here. One last round of applause, folks. Thank you.